Well, good evening. I, um, I thank you, Jeff. I thank you, uh, Ludwig. I thank you, Lou Rockwell. And I thank um, uh, Joe Maturisi for uh, sponsoring me. So congratulations to uh, Lou, the Mises Institute, to Ludwig himself, and to Murray Rothbart, and uh, to all of you who support this wonderful organization on this fine and festive occasion. So ladies and gentlemen, after 50 years on the job, that's me, 50 years on the job, it is a dull journalist who has not stumbled across even one sturdy, bankable truth. And I think I have found mine. It is this, money is not humanity's best subject. Money is not humanity's best subject. Uh, maybe our financial genome is missing. So for the evidence of this uh, humble conjecture is stamped in the cyclical record for all of us to see, and you will recognize it when I tell you. As investors, we tend to uh, buy high and sell low rather than the other way around. As lenders and borrowers, we tend to overdo it in a boom and underdo it in the predictable succeeding bust, and we are pro-cyclical creatures. Uh, it's just the way we are, that's just the, and we are this way in uh, constitutional monarchies and republics and democracies, statism, capital, that's just who we are. So theorists talk about efficient markets. Uh, they assume uh, rational investors and costless transactions and prices that instantly incorporate every scrap of available information. You might as well talk about efficient romance as efficient markets. Uh, yes, there do exist the steely-eyed money makers who build wealth by adapting uh, to circumstances and learning from mistakes. They, they do exist. But if the average investor learns from one cycle to the next, it's news to me. Uh, for all I can see, uh, they, that is we, uh, keep stepping on the same rakes. Um, so the last thing, the very last thing our fallible species needs is a monetary system that leads us into temptation. Yet that is precisely the system in place. A dozen years of suppressed interest rates have misdirected money, waylaid judgments, and turned the switch marked financial gravity to the off position. Uh, you've heard and read stories about UFOs. No, that's not UFO. They are stocks and bonds and cryptos and stuff floating in air. So um, I am going to tell you uh, in the four hours given to me this evening, I mean to uh, tell you about, I don't know, tell you about interest rates. Oh, my publication is named Grant's Interest Rate Observer, and I am in Clover because interest rates were barely perceptible. But now there's something to watch. So um, if I seem a little bit manic, it's because my business model has been validated so um, I am going to, my plan is to uh, uh, talk about the, uh, the source of the zero gravitational environment we live in. Uh, I have touched on the nature of the human material that does the investing. I'm going to project, or rather suggest to you that the Fed is the agent of entrapment, uh, that interest rates, uh, and their absence has been the key to the everything bubble. I'm going to touch on the consequences of this experiment. I'm going to mention the hypothetical, theoretical insolvency of the Federal Reserve. Let's see what else. Um, uh, I'm going to delve into uh, the extraordinary losses in financial markets, especially bond market losses, unseen in 4,000 years. And uh, I'm going to propose a solution to these difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Think nothing of it, madam. <laughs> All right, so, um, uh, you know, an interest rate uh, is a price. It's uh, most think of it as the price of a loan, and it is that. 
uh, but it is more uh, to borrow from the title of a new book by Edward Chancellor in a superb, superb book it is. Uh, interest rate is the price of time, the price of time. So Jeff Bezos knew something about the human condition when he created Amazon Prime. Uh, what he was banking on was the uh, people's impatience, their impetuosity. When we want something, we want it now. Uh, Murray Rothbard described this condition in a few short, well-chosen words, and they were this. So future satisfactions are always at a discount compared to present satisfactions. Uh, so you pay less for something that's promised than something you possess. So you, here it said that the rate of interest discounts expected future cash flows, and we all say, yes, yeah, quite true. Quite. But um, the words are somewhat um, uh, op opaque. So what does that mean? It means that uh, interest rates connect the future with the present. They adjust an investor's expectation of the timing of tomorrow's rewards. So very low rates of interest seem to reel those nuggets into the present. And very high rates of interest seem rather to push them further out over the horizon. So imagine, you are minding your business when your financial planner calls and he says, I have a stock for you. The stock is called an Uber, as some years ago. And uh, Uber is going to revolutionize the taxi cab business. And, uh, and you uh, are happen to be a student of Graham and Dodd and a, a value investing, you say, wow, well, what might this company called Uber be earning? Well, says the salesman, nothing just yet, but uh, you wait. In the fullness of time, it's going to uh, earn the profits that its, uh, its foresight and its vision um, have gifted it. That's what the salesman will say. Now, you have a choice. You can invest in that future promise, or you can take the here and now. If the here and now is priced at nothing, that is to say a 0% interest rate, you might be inclined to uh, leap at the chance of getting in on the ground floor of a great thing that's going to happen, says he. But if the present day is offering you, say, 10% on a treasury bill, you might be inclined to hang up the phone. So that's, that is the, that's what we mean by we say with this, the interest rates uh, uh, discount future, uh, uh, discount future cash flows. Uh, they calibrate our expectations about the future. They, if they're low enough, they kind of, uh, they, they subsidize fantasy, right? Where do you think this great levitation in tech stocks came from? Well, it came in one, in one way from the, the objective improvement uh, of technology, of human ingenuity. That was one source of the levitation of tech stocks. But another source was the lack of competition in the here and now. When interest rates are pitched at nothing, uh, the future looks ever so glistening. So um, uh, interest rates, they are a thing, as I mentioned, and that thing is a very potent force. Um, the uh, book that you have perhaps not spent much time with by your bedside is called The, uh, uh, the History of Interest Rates by Sidney Homer and Richard Silla. And um, uh, 2000 BC to the present, 4,000 years of interest rate history. It goes by in a flash. But I will compress that narrative for you in a few, in a few words. Um, how does, well, um, uh, interest rates have never been lower in 4,000 years than they have been in the past dozen. Zero um, percent, actually, in some respects, was a high rate of interest because uh, in 2020, as many as $17 trillion worth of fixed income securities were priced to yield in nominal terms, not adjusted for anything, less than nothing. So think about it. So you as a lender paid the borrower to accept your currency, Swiss francs, Japanese yen, 
uh, Swedish kroner and so forth and so on, mostly European. But $17 trillion dollars worth. So remember what Murray Rothbard he said, he said, he said that this would be impossible because future things were always priced lower than present things. And don't you remember the theories that were spun to explain the extraordinary, seemingly inexplicable phenomenon of negative nominal yields? Uh, people would say, uh, yes, uh, they are just where they ought to be because central banks are fighting the battle against deflation, against everyday low prices, which we abhor. <laughs> America spends half of Saturday seeking out the things that central bankers want to stamp out. Um, but facts are facts. 17 trillion is a lot of money, even when you say it fast, and that much money was devoted to paying people to take your money on a loan. And um, so the question that we at Grants always ask, did interest rates fall or were they pushed? Is this extraordinary alignment of rates, zero, slightly more than zero, less than zero, is this a force of nature? Is it a, is it a turn in the history of financial affairs or is it just another manipulation by the thimble riggers at the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. And it went on for long enough that uh, many people came to doubt the theory that central banks were behind this. But uh, um, So how has this worked out, this experiments in, uh, in extra low interest rates? Have you been reading the Wall Street Journal in recent years? And have you noticed, if so, have you noticed the uh, the line that uh, precedes often that modifies the term treasury bond, that uh, descriptor is super safe, the super safe treasury securities. Well, um, here is the way that the super safe securities have um, comported themselves in the first nine months of this year. Uh, long investment grade bonds down 28.4%. Um, the preceding worst result over 12 months occurred in 1841 when states were defaulting on their debts and that was only 22%, 22.9. So this was worse than 1841. Um, in many respects, it was the worst in 228 years, and I'm referring now to long-dated, indeed perpetual, uh, English sovereign securities called GILTS, G-I-L-T-S. And uh, British consoles, or these perpetuals, in the nine months were down 37.4%. The preceding, the, the runner-up worst, occurred during the Napoleonic Wars, when the English Channel was a very, very fraught place. And the worst of that period, 1803, was down 23%. So this year, through nine months, down 37%. During the Napoleonic War, darkness down 23 So in that case, the worst in 269 years. And unprecedented, too, is the tempo of the rise in bond yields, the fall in bond prices. Um, uh, bond prices tend to trend over the course of generations. It's a, it's a unique feature of the fixed income security. Um, from 1900 to about 1920, bond yields rose. And uh, it took them 20 years uh, to rise about um, one or two percentage points. Very, very slow rate of rise. Uh, the second a generational occurrence in the rise of interest rates occurred from 1946 to 81. And it took from 1946 to 1956 for the bond yield to rise one percentage point. Ten years, one percentage point from two and a quarter to three and a quarter. So by, by way of contrast, in, in uh, August of 2020, uh, ten-year treasuries were priced to yield one half of one percent. And recently they touched 4%. That's up eightfold, up eightfold in slightly less than two years. Never before seen. So the ferocity of this bear market 
uh, the speed of the, of the decline in price and the rise in yield is a new thing under the sun. And it, um, to me, it shines a bright light on the, on the power of the central banks uh, for ill and on the, uh, the snapback, the power of the snapback uh, to reverse the evident error in monetary policy low these many years. Um, so uh, this business about, um, uh, about the uh, essential security of government debt, I want to treat you uh, to the wisdom of a man named um, uh, Samuel Seabury, who was a Massachusetts judge on the Supreme, Massachusetts Supreme Court. And Judge Seabury presided over a case called uh, Harvard College versus Amory. And the details of the, of, the, of the lawsuit were not so very important. It concerned the nature of prudence in finance. It, it concerned the nature of the so-called prudent man. Today we would say uh, prudent man or woman. Uh, but in the day, it was the prudent man, and the prudent man had to do with, you know, how do you conserve the capital that is entrusted to you as a trustee? And Harvard sued a trustee called Amory because he had the temerity and the, and the, uh, uh, and the lack of perception to invest in these newfangled industrial enterprises rather than in government bonds. So here is what Judge Seabury said about the nature of risk and about the nature of government sovereign, of sovereign government guarantees and credit. Um, concerning the nature of risk, quote, it will not do to reject those stocks as unsafe which are in the management of directors whose well or ill directed measures may involve a total loss. Do what you will, the capital is at hazard. If the public funds are resorted to, what becomes of the capital when the credit of the government shall be so much impaired as it was at the close of the War of 1812, when the State Department could not raise the money to buy stationery? And here's what he said, Judge Seabury said, about the nature of sovereign credit risk. It may well be doubted if more confidence should be reposed in the engagements of the public than in the promises and conduct of private corporations which are managed by substantial and prudent directors. There is one consideration much in favor of investing in the stock of private corporations. They are amenable to the law. The holder may pursue his, pursue his legal remedies and compel them or their officers to do justice. Right, Elon Musk? But the government can only be supplicated. So, um, them's interest rates, and they are back. Um, so um, I promised you, and will now deliver, uh, some speculations on the consequences um, of the manipulation and suppression of the, of the, pro of the price of time. Um, well, you know, some of them are quite obvious, the big drawdown in the prices of, uh, of equities, especially those listed in the NASDAQ exchange, uh, tech stocks have uh, taken a great big beating. Um, uh, bond market losses you know about. What is less remarked upon are the unseen disturbances uh, that interest rates, so, so these lawn level rates have induced in uh, what the Austrian economists call the structure of production. And um, this has to do with the, uh, uh, well, it has to do with, in a way, with hurricanes. So uh, there's a Hurricane Andrew, which preceded the devastating Ian. And this was in the mid 80s, I guess. Hurricane Andrew was uh, a long time coming and very ferocious when he or it arrived. And uh, in fact, so long had the interval been before the, between the, 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 between, uh, the, the preceding bad hurricane and Andrew that building codes had, uh, been gone, had gone slack and builders had become a little bit uh, 
inattentive to the details of their craft and the losses uh, dealt by Andrew for that reason were extraordinarily, were extra extraordinarily devastating uh, because uh, uh, the world had become accustomed to the absence of truly horrific storms. And um, much the same thing I think pertains in the realm of finance. Um, a muscle memory is a powerful force, I think a, a much underrated force in finance. Uh, interest rates until uh, two years ago had been falling for 41 or so years, 41 years. You had to have had um, uh, one and a half Wall Street careers to have lived through and navigated a bear market in bonds, meaning a time of rising interest rates. Um, the 12 years uh, following the uh, financial crisis of 2007 to 9 were a time of, um, of very low rates and very easy credit and a time of great opportunity for the promoters of what used to be called leverage buyouts, but now have been rebranded owing to the difficulties of LBOs as private equity. And something like $3 trillion worth, nobody knows exactly, but $3 trillion worth of private equity, $3 trillion or so of venture capital has come into the world, securities that are not quoted on public exchanges. But their coming has been facilitated by these same zero rates. So if you're a venture capitalist, uh, what you hope and expect is that the stock market will be prepared to buy your um, uh, unicorn at a properly fancy multiple when the time comes to uh, launch it into the world. Uh, similarly with private equity, uh, you buy a company, you borrow money, with the proceeds of those borrowings, you pay the stockholders of the company that you are buying, and with the extra proceeds that you have borrowed, you pay yourself a big dividend. Now, in so borrowing the money and so leveraging the company, you are betting on smooth sailing in the macro world, and you are betting on, as are the venture capitalists, with an opportunity to exit in the public markets. But what happens if an unscripted inflation arrives? What happens if that unscripted inflation loosens the grip of the central bankers on the interest rates they have suppressed and the public markets are no longer welcoming. Well, we are looking at just that set of risks in a not small segment of the national economy. Now, um, uh, until fairly recently, the Fed was talking about a so-called soft landing, meaning that it artfully uh, would, uh, uh, would raise the rates of interest it controls just enough to, uh, uh, to crimp demand uh, supply chains would snap back into operation, and um, before you know it, we would resettle into the realms of 2% inflation and satisfactory growth, and we would live happily and profitably thereafter. Um, I thought then, and I think now, that the degree of difficulty in the soft landing uh, can be compared to that of the fraternity initiation trick. Um, Jeff Deese, would you please stand for a second and help me with this? Uh, please stand, Jeff, yeah. And get a grip on the tablecloth. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, the trick is, is, to, is to pull, if you go to, uh, if you go to WikiHow, you'll see that the, uh, uh, the trick is to pull it straight down. And you must be decisive. And WikiHow also suggests uh, for novice uh, practitioners that you use uh, plastic uh, uh, plateware and uh, uh, but but we can't do that in this economy we are stuck with uh, with crystal and with silver and with bull market champagne flutes and the fed unaccustomed as it is to this particular difficult trick is going to yank straight toward itself and the sound you hear may just prove to be the shattering of the aforementioned crystal. Now, I hear myself verging into dogmatism, but so many birthday candles have I blown out. I'm not going to predict that. I'm going to keep open-minded, especially before this august company, and only propound the idea uh, that the consequences of suppressed interest rates are both seen and registered and unseen and latent. 
uh, but the latent ones are the ones you have to watch out for. Uh, one could observe, apropos of this evening's change of setting, that climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. <laughs> So uh, up until early this year, um, as the title of my force, uh, I talk, I suggest nearly everything was, uh, seemed to be floating in air, and we seem to have lost gravitational force. Um, you know, the public debt bulged and credit creation accelerated and asset prices became disconnected, not only from the touchstone of value, but also in some cases, seemingly from reason itself. It was only last year, ladies and gentlemen, about this time, it's suddenly called Ether Rock, number 42, uh, went on the auction block. Now, Ether Rock is uh, number 42, is a non fungible token. Now, even with the four hours given to me, I haven't got time to explain what a non fungible <laughs> But think of it as a digital beanie baby. It is a collector's item, Ether Rock number 42 is a digital image of, um, of a rock, you know. And uh, if you were driving in from the Phoenix airport, you looked at these outcroppings of, uh, of mesas or uh, rocks. And I looked, I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I thought of um, Ether Rock number 42, which a year ago commanded a price at auction equivalent to one million three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Now, mind you, um, this was not something for you to own. You, the buyer, didn't own it. Uh, you got bragging rights on the, world, on, the, um, on the blockchain to say that uh, you bought it. But the detachment of investing from ownership I took and still take is, is kind of a disturbing trend. I mean, it's it's not really capitalism, right? <laughs> it's something else. It is, I don't know, it's a fancy, isn't it? And it's a fancy um, that could be traced, I do trace it, to the absence of gravity, the absence of interest rates, uh, a zero price of time. So that uh, $1.33 million investment in the thing you can't own that um, is down 90% um, from that price to date. And it was last autumn, too, when the price of Shibu Inu, which is a cryptocurrency, and again, time constrains me from explaining exactly why people buy things they can't see for money they possess for the hope of that thing appreciating on the thing that they can't touch. But they do. And uh, $3 trillion did a lot of talking in the day. If you are a libertarian, let us say, hypothetically, um, you're inclined to trust the, the judgments of individuals that come together and discover something in price, right? You can't, you can't scoff at them, even if you're, shall we say, a baby booter of a certain age. You really shouldn't. But I couldn't help myself. This Shibu Inu is a, is a, is a satire of Dogecoin, which itself was a send-up of Bitcoin. It's like yesterday's canceled flight to the Newark airport with the judge at me. They canceled one, there's a delay of the other, and the delay of the third on the delay. So Shibu Inu, last year, October, this registered a gain of 1,000%. No, 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 that was just in October. <laughs> Because Elon Musk said he liked it a little bit before he didn't like it much. So that sprint to the upside in October brought the year-to-date gain to an even 40 million percent. Of course, that's before tax. Well, at least one could lay ownership, uh, claim the ownership of the this immaterial monetary unit that bears the image of a cute little Japanese hunting dog, and for a nonce enjoyed the sponsorship of the fickle CEO of Tesla. Um, 
So here's what uh, um, our little journalistic lemonade stand, Grants, said a year ago. Uh, quote, with neither the discipline of a gold standard nor the coherence of market-determined rates of interest, we investors operate in a state resembling zero gravity where nothing is anchored and things that aren't nailed down go up. So perhaps the uh, zero gravity phase of American finance is over or ending. You know about Ether 42. It was down at 90%. Uh, Shibu Inu has given up 67% of its peak value. And um, you know, the, uh, uh, the not so amusing results in stocks and bonds um, are not quite so grim, but the standard 60% stock, 40% bond, Schwab, branded retirement portfolio, um, has suffered unusual drawdowns um, uh, this year. Of course, if the year's not over, they might recover, they might not, but um, um, uh, they are down, are these portfolios, as much as the worst of the same portfolio would have been down in the some years in the 1930s. Um, so, um, Um, there are other consequences of this bizarre cycle of interest rate suppression and the, uh, this beach ball, as it were, that's held under the surface of the water and now is bobbing up, bouncing up. Uh, there are other consequences. And one of these things is, uh, is, the, um, is, is, the, is the hypothetical, theoretical insolvency of the Federal Reserve System. Now, I choose my words carefully. I say hypothetical because it's, it, it, if a certain set of rules were not in place, it would be true, but it's not exactly true. And uh, theoretical because, um, in theory, one's capital ought to be in excess of uh, one's losses. I, but uh, the Fed, uh, through June, had suffered... Um, a markdown in um, its, uh, its, its uh, net worth of a substantial amount. It was uh, down in the mark-to-market. The Fed owns uh, many trillions of dollars worth of fixed income securities, which, of course, as you know now, has taken a big loss this year. And um, the Fed only holds $41.9 billion in capital. So the ratio of assets to capital at the Fed <clears throat> is well over 100 times, 200 times, I guess. So the Fed is not exactly leading from the front with respect to safety and soundness in the banking system. It, uh, the New York Fed is the most leveraged financial institution in New York City. Um, but the curious thing is, um, is uh, what the the Fed's kind of slipped into its um, financial statements in the first week of 2011, January 2011. There was a little recondite note in the balance sheet, in the footnotes of the balance sheet, saying that here to four, from now on, uh, uh, losses, if any, born in the income statement will be, in effect, journaled through uh, in a contra asset uh, and uh, will be deferred and the Treasury will backstop it. So what the Fed is doing it has suffered a drawdown in the value of its fixed income securities in excess of $700 billion. It has $41.9 billion in capital. It is hypothetically, theoretically broke, except those losses are treated on its balance sheet as a deferred asset, which the Treasury, in the fullness of time, will make good. And the Fed's not the only central bank in the world with this particular striking set of financials. The uh, Reserve Bank of Australia is similarly looking at negative net worth on this same basis, uh, ditto uh, the Bank of England. And as the news of the Bank of England's difficulties, difficulties of the pound unreeled in the past 10 days, I thought to myself that here, here is a demonstration of the inherent vulnerability and indeed, I submit to you, uh, the absurdity of the fiat standard carried to its nth degree of intervention. 
Um, so uh, way back when, in gold standard days, the pound was $4.187 to the dollar. Um, the central bank of Britain, the Bank of England, was a private institution earning a profit that became nationalized in 1946, but in the heyday of the gold standard, the Bank of England was a private institution. So what we now have is, is a central bank that is the property of the state that still talks about its independence from the treasury, the British treasury, although its solvency is in the hands of the treasury, and the pound is a dollar and small change and the bank is obliged to intervene in the guilt market, in the public debt market of Britain, to bail out a, a pension system that was leveraged to the hilt to try to compensate somehow for the, for the lawn level interest rates that the Bank of England, in concert with the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve System, had imposed in the world. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a thing, it's a scrape. And one thinks if one is an old fashioned liberal, a libertarian of a certain stripe, I, I sometimes um, wonder if I am not being overly nostalgic and thinking about the gold standard. I, I, I think I know it's, there are, there are no people proof monetary regimes as we all know. Um, but you know, I, I, I I wouldn't mind the return of the Brooklyn Dodgers to Brooklyn. I wouldn't mind <laughs> if Count Basie were up in the stage of Birdland. I would not mind if Murray Rothbard were among us. Not at all. Nostalgia must be the least repaying line of thought or musing on Wall Street. It won't do. One can't be nostalgic for the past. It's about the future. And there is something on the face of things anachronistic about a monetary standard that uh, resolves, that devolves on the, the digging of something material from the earth and refining that thing and sending it off to be stored. It doesn't sound like the 21st century, does it? There's, there's something undeniably anachronistic about it, given the world's preoccupation with monetary assets so-called you can't see or touch or own. And yet, it is the very tangibility of money, which in the day um, sustained the value of money and the structure of credit. Anachronisms. I was tw uh, 20 years old and I got a job just out of the Navy, I got a job in Wall Street and I, I was a clerk on a bond desk. And, um, and I was laid off in 1968 because Wall Street could not process uh, the business uh, that it was doing at the New York Stock Exchange. 15 million shares a day. And the Stock Exchange closed down on Wednesday afternoons to sort out trades. Extraordinary. Uh, the United States uh, landed on the moon one year later. <laughs> so they say. <laughs> <laughs> But here was, this, here was this, this paper, this landfill they called Wall Street. And I lost my job, $78 a week. Um, and was founded uh, in consequence of this scandal, administrative botching on Wall Street, was founded something called the Depository uh, Clearing Corporation, um, Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, DTCC. And DTCC came into the world to facilitate the rapid and efficient administration of financial flows. And has it ever succeeded? Wall Street could not process uh, 15 million shares a day. Uh, now the DTCC does 200 million plus. Um, over the 12 months of 2021, it settled securities transactions in the grand sum of $152 trillion. I see a trillion. Um, and, um, oh, that number was quadrillion. You know what quadrillion is? It is 1,000 trillion. 
trillions, uh, billions, what did I tell you? So a trillion, yeah, so that we're doing trillions now, many trillions of securities process. So that speaks a little bit, does it not, to the financialization of things. There's a wonderful phrase that a, a friend of mine uh, said that the, the optimization of the economy with regard to finance and asset prices, the optimization of the economy with regard, and that a little bit, to me, um, evokes the central problem of 4,000 year low in rates, of persistent intervention in markets. Um, and, and I wonder if our finances were not grounded, were not, were not uh, uh, hauled back into the rea reality of tangible things, if there were not something like um, an element and the periodic table of the elements that defined the value of money, that could support a superstructure of credit. This would not be a step forward and not an anachronism. Well, I have asked the kind of question that um, uh, the speaker asked when he wants you to know that he has the answer. The answer is yes. Um, but we really must do something about this institution, this Federal Reserve. I, um, uh, Ron Paul has convinced me of this. I, and I have been thinking about it, and I think I have a couple of answers. But first of all, I want, to, I want to remind you of the sheer willful ignorance of the uh, PhDs at uh, the Fed. There are 800 of these creatures who have earned the doctorate in economics, and I will deal with them in a moment. But first, I, I, we've been talking about our table at the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Apparently, there's a church in St. Louis having to do with a baseball team. And, um, <laughs> And I want to recall to you a story from 1968, Bob Gibson's great year, that speaks exactly to the Federal Reserve, lest you get impatient with the telling. Here it is, all right. So uh, this is great, Bob Gibson, the imperious, powerful pitcher of the St. Louis Cardinals, gonna win 20 odd games, he, mad because he lost three or something. He, um, and uh, there's an infield named Ducky Schofield, utility infield, good glove, no stick, lifetime batting average, 227, that's Ducky. So Ducky was a bat and, uh, and um, as was his want, he strikes out. So he slams down his bat. Uh, same with his batting helmet, comes back to the bench, breaks the water cooler, cusses up a blue streak. Gibson can't stand it, summons him over to hear what he, Bob Gibson, has to tell him, Ducky Schofield. So Ducky goes over and Gibson says, uh, pointing to his batting average, he says, Ducky, he says to him, what did you expect? What did you expect? So Federal Reserve, when you, um, uh, uh, when you uh, uh, subsidize consumption, uh, when you shut down production, and when you gun the money supply, what would you expect? So that's inflation. So what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, let us say that the dawn of a new gold standard is uh, for tomorrow rather than today. What do we do in the meantime? So as I say, I've given this some thought. I've got uh, a couple of things I would like to uh, propose to you. One is the, um, uh, 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 this, um, the shambles they call a balance sheet the Fed. I mean, it will not do that 41.9 billion supports 9 trillion in depreciating assets. This will not do. So how about, ladies and gentlemen, if the Fed were encouraged uh, to conform its financial practices to the rules and regulations laid down by the bank examiners themselves at the Fed and at the Basel record in Switzerland. How about if the Fed had to, uh, had to toe the mark on regulatory standards that it itself imposes on other banks? It would be unable to implement quantitative easing, so-called. So that's, uh, if, uh, if, if uh, I submit this to uh, Rand Paul via Ron. So let's get the Fed on board with uh, a little bit of solvency. And my other suggestion for the improvement of our finances and, uh, is, um, is that uh, there ought to be a Department of Common Sense <laughs> at the Fed. 
I know it's crazy, but so I, I, I envision this um, um, as an office with direct access to the chairman's office, be just down the hall. And um, uh, the personnel would uh, comprise, I don't know, uh, maybe you can help me with this. I, I'd say, first of all, a stay-at-home mother who knows what things cost and who is not going to buy transitory if it goes on for a year and a half. Um, there might be a financial historian. I myself am engaged, but uh, there might be someone who is available for this job. And I don't know, some a business owner or somebody from this, I think somebody from this audience might round it up. And the Department of Common Sense would uh, have uh, veto power over the pronouncements of the Board of Governors. That's my suggestion for you. Thank you. That's the thought. So I, th I think, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, um, something tells me, I think my New York time zone tells me um, uh, that my four hours are complete. Um, and, uh, but I have, um, uh, so uh, at, at a, a grants conference many years ago, um, T. Boone Pickens gave a talk. And he gets up, just as I, so he's, he gets up and then he says, uh, well, you know, I, I haven't, uh, I had, he had 40 minutes, 40, 4 -oh. He says, uh, I haven't really prepared anything, and uh, uh, I'm not very good at uh, this kind of thing. Um, so <laughs> I am the sponsor of this event, and I'm wondering what, have we filled the other 38 and a half minutes? And uh, he says, well, are there any questions? And uh, it carried through very nicely. So I promised uh, um, the authorities at Mises that if you were of a mind, I would stand for a couple of questions. Not that I have the answers, but I would certainly welcome them. So if you do, I, um, I will entertain them. If not, I'm going to go and sit right over there and nurse my wine. So um, your call, ladies and gentlemen, I'd be happy to uh, accommodate you. All right. So don't nobody drink that wine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, for crazy. <laughs> I wanted to know what you made of the Biden administration. I'm against it. <laughs> Um, not, not quite threatening, but almost threatening the OPEC uh, with their deep dissatisfaction with their decision to cut two million barrels a day of production. And what, what possible good outcomes could, could occur? Well, I think no good outcome. I think that the, maybe the administration was trying to save face by saying something, you know, some of the insults you, you don't want to necessarily walk away without saying so is your old man. Maybe that was the point of it. Um, but uh, this is really not my subject. I mean, I, 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 we all know that uh, um, if the Biden administration were truly concerned about the emission of greenhouse gases, it would not offshore um, fossil fuel production. It would simply invite us to uh, make do with our sweaters, right? That, that's, that would be the principal cause. But they are not concerned with that, hence they want others to emit those gases. So I think it is less than, uh, uh, less than noble for us to be following this. And uh, we have all the, uh, what's that? there's a famous story about uh, uh, Guadalcanal during the very darkest days of the, after the invasion and, um, and there wasn't, then wasn't much to eat and the, uh, commanding officer told the Marine, there's plenty of chow on this island. You find it. There's plenty of oil and gas in this country, and we have found it, right? So um, again, this is not my subject, but that's, that's my take on it. Debt jubilees. <laughs> well, it's no longer a theory, is it? That's right. So, uh, uh, well, you know, it's, it's not a new thing. Um, uh, uh, there is a biblical precedent, and there is uh, 
uh, American president, um, James Madison, found it necessary to denounce debt jubilees in one of the Federalist Papers. He called it Wicked Projects, and he linked debt jubilees with paper money. So uh, what is new now is, the, um, is, I guess, the pending or a contingent precedent of wide-scale forgiveness of student debts. And once you get into a bidding contest for that, of course, it's hard to tell where it ends. So this speaks, I think, to uh, Samuel um, uh, kind of Peabody. Samuel, what was he? Uh, Joe Biden. I just read you the Harvard versus Amory Seabury, uh, Samuel Seabury, um, uh, take on uh, the nature of public credit. And is it necessarily so superior? And, um, you know, as, as uh, Adam Smith said approximately these words, there's a whole lot of ruin in a nation. And I, you know, I began at Grants, we began producing uh, prospectuses on the, on the financial condition of the United States in the 1980s when, if you recall, um, uh, Ronald Reagan got up and, and I think in a, gave a TV address on the occasion of the public debt crossing the billion dollar, was it the trillion dollar mark for the first time in 1981? I think that was it. And he said, this is all you have to, have to know, trillion dollars. Well, now it's, was it 31 today? So I would say that this is, you know, the United States is now a split-rated investment-grade enterprise. It is, uh, it is AAA, AA+. Plus. And... Uh, uh, this business with the student loans, I think, is very disturbing for the public credit. And the whole, th the whole phrase, the integrity of the public credit, is never heard. And I think that that stems this indif seeming indifference to the public credit, the strength of the public credit, uh, stems from the many years in which anyone who worried about it uh, simply missed a great bond rally. You know, under Reagan... Um, uh, the public debt tripled and interest rates were chopped in half. So he needn't have given that, uh, that talk because it was going to be fine, right? And it's still fine a little bit in that the United States dollar, the embarrassment of the dollar is not its weakness but its strength. That's the, the cause of the anxiety. The world is rallying to it. It's better than the Japanese yen whose central bank is still more aggressively interventionist and who, whose idea of interest rate suppression is still more um, radical and, uh, and, uh, uh, and unbending. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 but, um, so I, I, would, I would call this uh, just another example of the uh, of the, of the uh, kind of the termites in the house of public credit. You can hear them chomping a little bit, but the house is still standing, you know. And, I know it. I mean, people are gonna find out they don't own anything, right? Oh. Um, they don't, yeah, they didn't seem to mind not owning NFTs while they were going up. Jim, is the Euro gonna survive? I'm sorry, say again? Is the euro going to survive? No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, but, but, uh, wait, wait. I mean, no paper currency survives, right? None ever has. I mean, the, the, dollar, is, the dollar is extant. Um, it's down 99 points. You know, it's, it's one of these functions where the rabbit hops ever closer to the wall. And, 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 uh, um, uh, but all these currencies lose their... Their value, the British pound, is of course a laughing, you know, is, a, is derisory compared to its its power its power value of yesteryear, and the and the euro is certainly, I would say certainly, that sounds also like dogmatism. I would say probably is um, is, is 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 tracing a, a speedier path to extinction because of the of the um, of the political organization of the of the European Union. So I'd, I'd say that, the, and you know. Um, the PhD standard under um, a social democracy, I think, you know, it's just, it's not going to, it's not, it's, not, it's not a place that, uh, uh, that you, a prudent person would pit, put her, his or her money for a store of value, I would say. Uh, all 
Thank you. <laughs>